Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to Reasonable Doubt, brought to you by the Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association. I'm your host, Jimmy Ardwan, alongside my co-host, Julio Vela. How's your week been, my friend? Well, two things. Number one, anytime I'm not jumping out of a window of a burning building where the fire marshals are planning on how they're going to catch people jumping out of a burning building. We, gotta, we, gotta, we definitely got to talk <laughs> yeah, about that. I'm good. <laughs> but also, number two, when I'm with my favorite state rep, oh, come on. I'm, uh, I'm overjoyed and, and pumped to be You don't there. even live in his district. <laughs> no, but I know the guy. I know him. I know him, though. I you know you him. see me on a regular basis. Yes. We welcome Gene Wu to the program. What is this? It's like your third time back. You're like a glutton for punishment coming yeah. on the show with us. I'm, I, guess you I like think it. you should have me more. I think we should. Too. Love talking about these issues. I, I'm just. I'm glad you're here. Yeah. It's always good to have you on the show. We will be with Gene for the next hour, uh, talking all sorts of variety of stuff. We'll talk about criminal justice issues. We'll talk about what's going up and on up in Austin. We'll probably talk a little bit about uh, what's going on up in D.C. as well, because it's getting interesting up there too this week. But uh, we'll uh, open up the phone lines about halfway through the program. 713-807-1794 is the number. I'll also have Twitter up at HCCLA underscore TV. And you can send your questions and comments right there for all three of us. Tweet away. Um, huh? Tweet away. Tweet away. Tweet, 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 tweet. I don't, so, I don't, know, I don't know about this Twitter thing. I, really? It's, it's all very Yeah, you don't know about it at all. The tweets? Uh, <laughs> the tweets? Is the tweets. That, the tweet? So let's 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 talk before since you had the great lead in on it. I, I want to talk about this uh, fire marshal situation <laughs> down at the. I mean, what an embarrassment, man! So they they basically, for those of you who aren't lawyers and aren't down at the courthouse, and but if you happen to frequent around the courthouse, as you know, we've all been displaced. All the courts have been displaced from the normal criminal justice center into the civil courthouse, the new civil courthouse. Some are in the juvenile justice center, and the county courts are over in the old family law center, which is literally an asbestos-laden, condemned building that was set for, uh, I think it was set to be demolished. It's a death trap. Uh, it is a death trap. And so this week, as everybody's walking around the courtroom, all of a sudden, the, the fire marshals come out in, in mass force and start looking at everything. and. We come to find out that uh, there's inadequate sprinkler system, that uh, there's all sorts of problems with the building, and basically we could all die. I think uh, it was, I think it was uh, Troy McKinney's quote at the end that sums it all up. People are going to die, end quote, Troy McKinney. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it said. That's what it said. I, I mean, it's insane. The, the fire marshals are literally out there, and I think this is what it did. They, they knew that this problem was going on, and they went down there to, to sign off and sign an understanding of, hey, look, you know what? This is unsafe. We're cleaning our hands of this, and it's, it's I, Mayor and Mr. Ed Emmett. I think are, you're right, because what came out in the newspaper was that the county judge and our mayor signed a deal basically saying, yeah, we know it's a problem, but... Yeah, we're we're basically in a time of emergency. Yeah, I, we're just in a tough spot. There's just not much you can do. I mean, um, after Harvey, um, you know, you have, where are the DAs? The DAs over West Loop. Yeah, they're by the Galleria. Well, they're like I mean, five that's a, different. That's a that's a 15, 20 minute drive from downtown. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm I'm not a big fan of the current situation. Um, it, it wrecks our schedule. I, I'm glad the civil courthouse now gets to feel some of our pain, though. <laughs> Um, they get get to experience elevator hell along with, with the rest of us. And, and um, it's so funny today because I, I was in the civil courthouse for a criminal setting. And, you know, they've got it divided up where there's two criminal or four criminal courts on one side and the civil courts are on the other. And there's just mass chaos on one side where all the yeah. criminal courts are and it's loud and people shouting at one another. <laughs> and there's a bunch of civil lawyers standing out looking down. They're the like hallway. scared of us. <laughs> What's going on down there? Uh, <laughs> Uh, now we're gonna go fight about money over here, life and liberty over there. But seriously, when the uh, fire department says, hey look, okay, we're gonna put the fire engines here and put the ladder up to the window there and we'll put the big trampoline over here. <laughs> and uh, I'm just waiting for them to like hand out brochures in the family law center. What to do to, in case of yeah, emergency. What, to do, what window to jump out of because um, <laughs> I had nightmares of it. The night, like that night I read it, I said, oh great. And then I had this vision of me like slamming a, a window out of the 
the designated window to, to jump on the trampoline and me like, you know, saving people and then me jumping out. And it's just, it's terrible. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, and then I think. What, what's, also, what's, the, what's the schedule for the CJC to be fixed? Do you know? I think they no, said. they haven't. They, it's going to be like well, they're saying, 2019. 2020. 2020? 2020. Awesome. Is, uh, yeah. Because yeah. they've, they've got, they haven't even gotten a bid yet. Yeah. They haven't even bid it. And, and this, it's stuff like this where I've said like, hey, you know, it would be great if the governor would open up the rainy day funds, would call us in for a special session so we can give the county a couple of million bucks to say, hey, look, you're the second largest county in the nation, population six and a half million. Maybe you should have your own criminal court justice building. Yeah, and, and maybe it should be functioning. Yeah. I mean, look, there's a bunch of vacant office, office space in downtown. Why are they trying to shoehorn people into... You know, I, I mean, I understand I think, I think there's, county buildings yeah. and everything, but they're, they're, look, there's a much more viable way to yeah. do this for the it, efficiency of the yeah. system. But I, I, I think I think the, the county's in a tough spot. Yeah. Um, I think the state needed to step in and help out. And well, and I think the judges have now realized, yeah. like, yeah. this is a serious problem. Yeah. It's uh, a big problem because I mean I think they realize that their safety is at risk too. Everybody's safety is at risk. It's not. It's not just them. It's the, it's yeah. it's everybody who works in that building uh, on day in and day out is really at risk uh, given given the safety issues in that that place. Over the weekend, I did see new rails put in, so you have to walk up because I. Out of the four elevators, rails. only I think two work. Yeah, rails in the staircase. In the stairwell. No, you the no. you use a family court building. Yeah, everyone like most of the attorneys use the oh, staircase because I've been using the staircase. Yeah, because it's those those elevators are just a, a joke. Well, I was doing it to work out my. Work out <laughs> my calves are amazing right now. <laughs> my thighs are amazing right now because of all the steps I've been walking. I don't even think they have a sprinkler system, and so apparently the top two floors are are sealed off from public access because they don't even have a, a sprinkler system from what from what I read I mean yeah. like and that's why they moved the they, that's why they moved the family courts over to the civil uh, courthouse because rather than spend the money retrofitting that thing to keep everybody in there they just said ah oh, well we'll just go move everybody over to the new civil courthouse okay so where do we what do we have court in the streets yeah where do we put how people about, how about just arrest fewer people charge fewer people for stupid stuff. Well, I, I've made that suggestion for a while. It's like, hey, how about we stop arresting people for pot? Th yes. Speaking That's of that, thing. speaking of that, um, uh, misdemeanor marijuana's back. Yeah. I'm getting, I'm seeing charges on a daily basis for misdemeanor for class marijuana. Class B's? Class B's, not school zone, no intended delivers. But is that people who didn't complete the first chance program? Uh, it, uh, the response that we're getting, it's officer discretion and prosecutor discretion. discretion. Yeah. They're back. Or lack of discretion. Or lack of discretion. discretion. They're back. And uh -huh. it's not just the the counties around Seabrook and League City. I mean, not counties, cities, Libra, uh, League City, Seabrook, Galveston, those kind of, uh, well, Galveston not with us, but uh, misdemeanor marijuana is back. Yeah. So I actually asked the. It took me a long time, but I finally pulled numbers mm -hmm. from um, from Harris County DA's office. Um, roughly like 2014, there are a little bit over 10,000, like 10,800 um, marijuana misdemeanor marijuana charges filed. Right. It, and it drops like every year a little bit. Uh, it's gone down quite a bit. So by like 2016, you're looking at like just a hair under 9,000, or a hair over 9,500, somewhere, somewhere around there. So I mean like this, this is showing 10,000 cases a year for misdemeanor marijuana. It's a lot of people. There is. That's a lot, that's a lot of jail, jail space. That's a, that's a lot of money that the county's spending for. And we just had our first medical marijuana dispensary open today in Texas. Yeah. Did it? It did. For the, no, but that's just for the cannabinoid oil. Right. Um, no THCs. But. <laughs> But but I mean hey that's nice, nice try Jamie but that's a huge thing it is it is I mean look uh, look baby, I mean, look where we are steps, nationally man. look where we are nationally <laughs> yeah um, the national polling just basically says sixty percent of all Americans just sort of like just make it legal now well and, yeah and and, uh, and, and, and the yeah term, I'm not a big pot advocate by no. any means but I'm just saying like it's, it's a stupid way to spend taxpayer money it is and and, and our attorney general is in Florida. Talking about yeah. the opioid crisis and how they want to rain down on that, and it's yeah. like, well, but 
wait a second, it, our, it, our, our politicians are yeah. in the pocket of big pharma, so well, how are you well, going to rein that in? And, and this is completely contradictory to the current thinking in the medical field is like there are states and medical professions are now saying like, let's use marijuana to get people off of heroin. Yeah. Because marijuana at least helps them cope with it and lets them calm down. It, you know, it, it, it helps them deal with the withdrawal symptoms so they can actually get off of it. Well, and the NFL is considering allowing, you know, yeah. not, not CTE. Yeah, no. not not uh, suspending players due to mar marijuana use. I recently uh, listened to a, a, an NPR uh, story where <clears throat> the majority of veterans surveyed uh, prefer for PTSD and various other ailments, uh, marijuana yeah. over opioids yeah. and over painkillers. However, the VA is in a position yep. where they can't prescribe and they can't subscribe to the policies of, of marijuana versus right. these other opioids. And so not only do, let's say, 60% of the population uh, uh, are in favor of some sort of doctor prescribed marijuana, uh, but there's a subsection, the veterans yeah. who are suffering from PTSD, who, are, who have fought for our country and who are coming back, they'd rather get prescribed some marijuana versus these opioids. Well, of course, painkillers. because they've watched their friends get addicted uh, to opioids, watch their friends uh, just basically start using heroin or any other type of um, uh, drugs like that instead, because because you know, the opioid, the prescription opioids gets really expensive after a while. Once your once your insurance runs out, once you're over your medication, then you have to start buying it. It gets real expensive. You know what's cheaper? Heroin. Heroin's cheaper. Um, uh, you know, I, I I have juven I represent a lot of juveniles, and I've had a number of juveniles that, that they're in serious trouble, but they tested for pot. I said, like, dude, you know you're in trouble. Why are you using pot? so I can sleep at night because, you know, I, I have all these thoughts and I can't get them out of my head and, uh, you know, they have so much trauma in their life and just smoking like pot like once a week, they can calm down and just deal with being, you know, live, living where they live. Yeah, I recently read an article uh, dovetailing on what you said about uh, juveniles and marijuana or use and, and violation uh, when they're in the system, for yeah. example. Um, that uh, Texas uh, has a big problem with juveniles being incarcerated, whether in juvenile facilities mm -hmm. or with ad in adult facilities. Yeah. Um, is that true? And what are, what are your thoughts? Yeah. On that? So it's 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 a uh, two different things. One is about uh, juveniles being incarcerated uh, post adjudication, and one is pre adjudication. Of, right. Right. So. There's a big problem with post-adjudication incarceration because we're, you're talking about TJJD. You're talking about essentially prison for kids. Mm -hmm. um, there used to be like a population of like a 5,000 kids in state lockup. That number over the years after lots of reform has gone down to about 1,000. There are five units left uh, in TJJD. Um, and if you read the papers, you read Texas Tribune, uh, the Texas Observer, they're, they're terrible. Um, because they're very, very far away. They're way, way understaffed. They're way, way underfunded. And you have essentially five facilities taking care of a thousand kids. There's not a lot of eco economies of scale. Um, so they're constantly short on staff. And the staff they can get are not always the best. And so there's a, it's, it's just ripe for abuse. And a lot of those kids are there because they violated their previous probation because they were smoking pot on the probation, they, they missed going to court, they did something they weren't supposed to do. Um, some of them are there because they pick up new charges, but a lot of times they're picking up new misdemeanor charges. Mm -hmm. um, and they're not what we call, uh, they're not serving a determinate sentence, yeah. which basically says like, there's a good chance you're gonna go to adult prison after you finish this one, right? So there's only about 250 of them out of the thousand that are uh, determinate sentences. That means that there's a good chance they're gonna serve, finish serving in juvenile, then be transferred over to adult side. What? So, you know, one of the big things we're trying to do is like, oh, how about we just stop putting these kids into prison yeah, no kidding. who are not determinate sentence. If they're not gonna be transferred to an adult prison, why, do we, why are we putting, spending the money putting them into a juvenile prison? Um, I think 
judges around the state are pulling back and, and sentencing fewer and fewer kids to TJJD because they understand it's not effective, it's a really bad place, kids are not getting the help they need. Um, and that's something we can talk about. We can talk about what we're, we're working on for next yeah. session to change all this. The, the second thing um, really connected to Harris County specifically, if you read the, the Chronicle article that came out, is that we're locking a lot of kids up before they're adjudicated. Right. And that's a real big problem too. Um, in the past, uh, I think you know the Arnold Foundation or one of the foundations gave Harris County like a bunch of money to say like you guys need to study this uh, and look at the problem this way and then get your numbers down, get your get your pre adjudication numbers down, and we did that and the numbers went down and slowly it's been creeping back up. This is unusual because nationwide there has been a dramatic decrease in the number of juvenile arrests because. Um, sort of like in 2015, um, we passed legislation like sort of banning zero tolerance at schools, saying like you just you cannot have a blanket policy where you just say every kid who does this is going to get arrested. Every ca individual case has to be considered. Uh, we told schools stop sending ki us kids um, for stuff that just they're just being kids. I know that it, it could be a crime, but stop. Yeah, right? that's my question: is where are most of these kids getting arrested for? Because like I just don't think. Yeah. You should arrest kids for smoking pot. Yeah. I don't even think you should arrest kids for having cocaine. I just don't. I think that that is an issue that it, it, putting them in handcuffs, taking them to jail, that doesn't solve the problem. I mean, you know, and I realize a lot of these kids, the, the argument is, well, a lot of these kids don't have the structure at home right. to really deal with that. I get it. I get it. But there's a better way to deal with it. Cause, and, and the kids that do have structure at home, you know, maybe they're not getting arrested, but I can guarantee you what my dad would have done to me had I gotten, you yeah. know, caught yeah. and, and, and at police showed up would have been 10 times worse is what the, the court system would have so done. So this is actually a really good point. One of the things that uh, we worked on last session and, and we made some big changes and put a lot of funding in is to work on the CPS system. Yeah. Um, and this session, this next session, we're going to spend a lot of time working on juvenile justice issues. And... The reason is because CPS is connected to the juvenile justice system. There's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of kids in juvenile that have cases in CPS and a lot of cases in CPS that have case, the, the juveniles have cases in, in court, in juvenile court. Um, but one of the things that we've talked about for the longest time that we've not really been able to implement because there's no money for it is talking about wraparound services for kids. You know, I'm of the fundamental mindset that children are not born bad. Like somebody made them this way, like whether that's society as a whole um, or their parents, wherever it is, this kid wasn't born bad. That we've created a system or a situation where they have become uncontrollable. A um, lot of it has to do with mental health issues. A lot of kids who get charged with serious crimes, if you look at their psychological exams, they're, they're generally generally very low IQ. They have sort of untreated, undiagnosed, severe mental health issues. Um, they have the inability, just absolute inability to control themselves. And we've provided nothing for them until this point. And it's unfortunate that, you know, it's taken them to be arrested for them to get help. Yeah. I mean, literally, I, I've represented kids where the families, like the kid's supposed to be on medication, but they're not because they can't afford it. And once they're actually adjudicated in juvenile, well, now, because they're on probation, we can get them help because we can now get them on Medicaid and pay for their stuff. And all of a sudden, their behavior changes and everything else changes. But there's other factors of, like, we need to have the money and the resources to go reach out to these parents. And you say, like, bad parents? Absolutely. There's a lot of kids are in trouble because their parents mm -hmm. don't do what they're supposed to do. But, you know, sometimes parents... You know, let's be honest. A lot of parents don't know what they're supposed to be doing. Last or they session, don't care. Or they don't, <laughs> but, but those things can be worked on. Yeah. Last session you said you worked a lot on, uh, or the session, uh, there were a lot of points brought up with CPS. Is, is, uh, have there been any advancements? And what's the role in CPS in juveniles yeah. when it uh, crosses over with the uh, justice system? Um, what we did for sort of the, the, the overlapping like Venn diagram of CPS and juvenile um, was fairly rudimentary what we, in this last session. Um, the real big thing that we made changes in is to, about how they're to, to talk to each other. 
uh, we sort of like ordered CPS and juvenile probation uh, or TJJD to say like, look, you guys need to devise ways to talk to each other and to share resources. Um, you might have a kid with both C a CPS case and a juvenile case that they get sent to two different psychologists. Right. Why would we do that? The state's paying for both. It seems really stupid to, you know, just double up on that, send them to one. But what they need to do is talk to each other and figure out how to do that. Um, some of it is, uh, I've had CPS cases where the, the, the CPS just, just doesn't have the resources and this kid needs to go see, you know, a certain type of specialist or whatever it is. And I, I, and I talked to the lawyers and I've said this so many times in cases, like I wish this kid would just get arrested. I wish this kid would go do something bad and get arrested because if they were in the juvenile system, I could then get them the help they needed. And so it's like, I, I wish we could use some of your resources. Um, getting a kid psyched in, in, um, in uh, the CPS world is, is really takes a long time. Well, what's, what's been happening with juvenile and CPS cases post Harvey? Because I'll, I'll, you know, we've only talked about what happens in misdemeanor yeah. and felony land and the problems there, but I don't, I don't think we've ever even really explored what's going on in juvenile and CPS. It's, uh, for the most part, I think the, um, the juvenile building was spared. Um, I think the upper floors, I think like everything uh, above five got water damage. I think so basically uh, Schneider's Court at 315th mm -hmm. got, got flooded. So, but um, the 314th is, and 313th I think are mostly okay. Or, and I think the 314th took some damage as well. I'm not really, it's not like extensive damage. I think they just took the opportunity to, hey, let's go ahead and fix some of the things mm -hmm. um, that we need to fix anyways. Uh, I think uh, I've heard rumors that the building's supposed to be back within the next couple of months. Um, that we're supposed to be back. So, the they're they're using you know like the three thirteenth um, uses the detention court room to conduct their hearings, and then um, the three fourteenth is like stuck in like a little side mm. like storage area. Um, it, it's not ideal, but it, it's nowhere nearly as bad as like being in the civil building or the family court building. Well, how are the dockets proceeding? I mean, are it's it's going well. I mean, as well as could be, I think, you know, um, maybe I'm just like too deep in the forest or too, too close to the trees to really see the forest, but I, I don't, I feel it's being managed well. Um, it's, you know, I feel like my case has got like knocked off of court track for a little bit, but everything seems to feel like it's, it's sort of like back on course and it's yeah. nowhere as bad as uh, other places. You talked about, um, having uh, juveniles uh, have access to either psychological evaluations yeah. or um, uh, treatment or at least interviews by a medical professional. Yeah. Um, how do you see the state legislature addressing juvenile brain development yeah. and juvenile Trauma. appreciation of the, the consequences of their actions? Right. And <clears throat> Is there a push for that, and what's the status of that now? You know, um, a lot of people think it's strange when I say this, but Texas actually is one of the leaders in criminal justice reform and juvenile justice reform, and it's, it's actually much, Texas is actually much better than many, many other states that we would say are more progressive. Um, I, I don't know why that is. I think it's, it's sort of the libertarian streak uh, of the state that, you know, you have a lot of like conservatives who basically don't like the criminal justice system either. Um, but for the most part, I think there is a willingness to do this. I think there is a strong uh, coalition that wants to get together, both liberal and very liberal and very conservative, like have basically reached together and say like, we want to do this, we want to fix it. You know, they may want to do it for different reasons, but they have the same end goals. Some of it is on the conservative side, it's like, well, we want to be smarter about crime. We want to be smarter about the way we deal with criminal justice. If we can help juveniles do better, that means that they don't become adult criminals. Right. And that we don't have to spend the money to incarcerate somebody in T TDCJ. Um, on the liberal side, you would say, like, this is a matter of social justice. This is a matter of ending the cycle of poverty and stopping, um, you know, uh, a sort of an instance of poverty from becoming a lifelong um, mark because of crime. Um, I don't really care why people want to, want to make the changes. I'm just happy that we have a strong coalition that's willing to go forward and say, like, we're going we're gonna to put money in this. We're going to make fundamental, actual changes to the system.
So do you think we'll get a state law to decriminalize marijuana? Um, I think so. Uh, I've carried that bill. Uh, I've carried a reduction in criminal penalties, not a full decrim right. uh, every session. It, it basically takes... Uh, you Knocks know, the amounts down. Yeah, it, take, it, it, it carves out a chunk out of B. Uh, it carves like uh, 10 grams, essentially what's... It's like 9.9 uh, .9, um, uh, 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 grams yeah. and drops it down to a C. Um, that's sort of my compromise with law enforcement, with the DAs, basically so that it can still be a basis for arrest if you need to arrest. <coughs> mm -hmm. It can still be a basis of a search if you need the search. But if you are, like, for the most part, it's some kid at school, dude, just write them a ticket. Don't yeah. send them to Harris County Jail. Yeah. Don't spend, you know, a couple thousand dollars of taxpayer money to deal with a kid with a half a joint of weed. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Chairman Moody, uh, Joe Moody from El Paso, has carried a full decrim, like a, a, not only a decrim, but a, like a, a legalization and a taxation bill. Just not there yet. Yeah, I, I don't think we're there yet. Um, somebody bet me that we would have full, full legalization in five years. I don't think we're gonna get there. I, I think that's overly optimistic. Um, the best I can hope for is at least a partial decrim and reduction of penalties and to remove sort of like the really, really negative um, collateral consequences of having just a little bit of marijuana. Um, something like 95, 97% of the cases of the marijuana charges are for class B. Mm. So, um, you know, and if you take away, and like, I'm sure... I mean, you guys have a lot of experience doing this. Most, almost all of it's under 10 grams. Yeah. Because yeah, 10 grams is, it's quite a bit. Yeah. That's, a, that's a good weekend. Well, uh, I mean, the district attorneys initially, the misdemeanor marijuana is back, everybody. But, um, you know, under four ounces, who walks around with four ounces in their pocket? Are you serious? Or whatever it is. I mean, that's, yeah. that's a lot of weed. No, no, I mean, people understand. People say, like, oh, a couple ounces. Dude, a couple ounces that's of dried a, marijuana is yeah. a lot. That's a lot of weed. What um, are you doing with that? If you, if you have, like, if you have four ounces, you're distributing. That's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so let me, let me ask you, let me ask you this. Um, okay, so misdemeanor marijuana, juveniles, um, d are you in favor? Or what's your opinion on punishing the parents? Should the, uh, I knew there was some stuff in the news about like you, oh, parents trying to get punished. How would you? I mean, the problem is from a like, let's say let's from a civil libertarian perspective is how would you punish the parents? Like, what 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 basis of law are you saying this person did nothing? Which is probably the problem, um, and we're going to punish you for it. I mean, the a failure to act unless there is a legal requirement to act is generally un not punishable under American jurisprudence, right? Like, right, right. Well, and, and aside from that, we don't need any more laws that, that criminalize being negligent, yeah. okay? I mean, I, I, why we ever got away from that and started getting away from criminal intent in the first yeah. place, I mean... Uh, yeah, but that's not to say it's not possible to have CPS involved. Fair. Right? Mm -hmm. Or have it, some civil administrative penalty. And there's a lot, I've had a lot of juvenile cases where where I said to myself, boy, it would be great if they would dismiss this case and let CPS take over. Huh. Um, unfortunately, CPS does not have the resources and they would do everything in their ability to say, not our problem, not our problem. Because every kid that take in, especially kids with severe mental health issues, like kids who get arrested, um, severe emotional, behavioral, violent outbursts, those kids are really expensive. But, but really, really expensive. But don't you also set it up for the potential, and by the way, if you want to call in, ladies and gentlemen, 713-807-1794 is the number. Uh, we've reached about 830 now, so feel free to call in for your questions for Julio, myself, and our guest, Gene Wu. Um, but don't you set up kind of the argument with what you're talking about in terms of punishing the parents? Yeah under certain circumstances that it, it becomes a, um, a socioeconomic or almost yeah. a racial issue? Because think about it, I mean, you know, who is likely, who, what, what set of parents are likely to get punished in that situation? Right. And, I mean, you kind of hit the nail on the head. Yeah. Um, I mean, the memori we, memorial parents whose who kids get found with weed in their backpacks, they're not going down. Look, I mean, right? go, go, talk on, they, go talk to no. an old cop. Go talk to an old cop. And I guarantee you, they'll tell you a story of, oh, yeah, back in my days, um, when we caught a kid with pot, we would just go, Bruh! yeah, you know, and the pot was gone, and we would call their parents, yep. and they'd go home and get their ass whooped. 
You know what? I mean, like, I'm sure that still happens in I'm nice, sure affluent neighborhoods, but I yeah. guarantee you it doesn't happen in the hood. No. You know, it doesn't happen in my district. Uh, yeah. No, you know, I wish it did, because a lot of those kids have enough problems. They don't need to be hauled in the court for having a little bit of weed. Right, but it's not happening. I mean, that's that's the reality. And so you, you, you set up for another socioeconomic war uh, with by, right. by implementing so, penalties on parents. And, and so sort of like, instead of the stick, what we should... What we say that we can't use a stick, but that we should use a carrot, right? And what, what what a lot of what we're proposing is like, look, if a kid gets in trouble, what we need to do is figure out one why. Why is that kid in trouble? Um, you know, for everything from just behavioral problems where they need therapy to some look. There's some kids who are misbehaving because they've suffered pretty severe trauma. Uh, I, I have had cases where look, they're reacting this way because they've been sexually abused. Mm -hmm. And no one has provided them any any therapy, any counseling at all. And it's just an open wound for them. And, and you said, like, we need to find out what's happening to these kids. Some, some kids are just acting out because they're bored. And it's like, like... Um, some kids are just a-holes. I mean, the yeah, reality is, I mean, go, but they're going back. But they're a-holes for a reason. Well, I don't know. No, I, mean, I think... I, I, I do. I, I, I disagree with you a little bit. I, I think you can draw a distinction between being bad yeah. and being an a-hole. Yeah, I mean, I mean, some, pe some people just have that innate, like, well, you're, you're, you're a jerk. I mean, like, yeah. like I, look, I, I consider meet myself... Meet their parents. I bet you their parents are jerks, too. Probably, but yeah. I mean, I, I so, okay, it, it probably does have something to do with it, but I've met enough kids, both in, you know, when I was growing up and by virtue of having a kid in school myself, that they have completely great parents. Yeah. And their kid's well, a jerk. But you know it's what? Like he's a, he's, he's a, why is he punching people? We, his parents are so nice and he's sitting there punching people. Because like, it's a teenager. These are, these are elementary school kids. No, it, I mean, it doesn't matter. Sometimes. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Different kids react different yeah. ways. I mean, like a lot of times, uh, sometimes kids are just kids. I mean, the, why, why do teenagers do stupid things? Because they're stupid. Right. Um, and they don't realize they're stupid until they get older. And you know how much, how many things have you done that when you look back when you're like 25 or 30, you look back and go, totally. Oh, did wow. I did I, I do that? Fifth, fifth. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I mean, it's just it's. But it's like that it was a. But you know, we, you, you, and I, and all of us, we grew up in a world where our parents protected us from those consequences. Man, I did my share of stupid stuff. Even being like the nerdy Asian kid, you know, <laughs> I did my share of the stupid stuff. My parents protected me and sure. kept me from the consequences. But what if you didn't? Right? No, I agree. But I, mean, and, but I think kids should be think, allowed I mean, to grow up, or be allowed to make those mistakes and learn, like every other human being on this planet, how to cope with being a teenager. And then. Completely agree. I mean, I yeah. think you take that same personality a kid. And depending on the area of town they grow up in, I mean, they can have that same yeah. personality. And, you know, if, if, if they come from the poor side of town, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's, it's going to exacerbate that, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. That's so, characteristic. And when we work on, um, when we work on issues like raise the age, like yeah. raising the juvenile jurisdiction to age 18, I get a lot of, like, legislators who say, like, well, they, they, know, they know better. I'm like, they may know better. But they can't connect the knowing better with controlling their actions. So like, you, you, if you have anyone who's ever dealt with a teenager or has a teenager at home, you go ask them, hey, why'd you do that? Yeah. What's their answer going to be? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Why'd you eat right. Tide Pods? I don't know. Yeah. So, the, I mean, like, we've got idiots eating detergent today, you know? And, I mean, but the, like, the, the, the answer literally is true. They literally do not know because no. the teenage brain, even though they, they, they look like an adult, they, they, something, they sound like adults, their brain has not developed to the point where they can connect those two things of, hey, this is, has bad consequences and this is my action. They can connect them. If you say, hey, can you connect those two things up? They can do it. Right. But at the moment, that they're doing it, they're not thinking about it. You talked about um, if only this child had services or if only yeah. this child had this access to these resources. So it's not just a child, the parents. Or the parents yeah. too. So uh, are there plans to address this in the next session or? I, yes, um, it's something that we're working on. Just like uh, last session before working on CPS issues, we, we went around the state, like literally to as far as Amarillo, Lubbock, and met with uh, met with the the stakeholders, met with judges, attorneys, anybody who wanted to talk to us, uh, and just went out and talked to them. Like, hey, what do you want? Tell me what you want. 
and we tell me what your problem is, uh, tell me how to fix it. Um, or if you just have a complaint, just tell me. And we, we took it out. And we figured out we had a big game plan of here are the ideas for next time. And we compile those ideas into bills and that we pass it into law. Uh, we're doing the same thing for juvenile. We're going, we're starting from like sort of a Houston and Austin because it's the easiest and moving out and further and further out in the state and say like talking to juvenile probation chiefs, talking to uh, judges, talking to attorneys, tell me what you want. If you had a magic wand, you wanted to make the system better, tell, tell me what you would fix. Have you found a consistent uh, yes. answer? Yes. And, and what would some of them be? Number one is money. Fair. <laughs> Shock. I know it's shocking. All about the money. Um, uh, you know, Harris County at least is not as bad off as some of the other places. Harris County, a lot of the money comes from the county itself. So the, whatever is short by, shorted by the state, the county can, you know, they're not happy about it, but they, they'll, they'll throw in some money, extra money to patch it up. The smaller counties don't have that luxury. They're almost, their juvenile probation system is almost like 100% funded by, by the state. So the state starts shorting money, they're like, well, we're screwed. Uh, we're, we're just going to stop offering mentorship services, um, something like that. So, number one, get more money down to the counties. Get it down to people who actually know how to use it and know how to use it well. Um, number two, decentralize a lot of the state incarcerations, TJJD. Um, you know, I think there's been a lot of talk about TJJD should just stop running prisons. Um, one, have fewer of those kids in prison. Two, take that money, send it to the counties and one of the things I propose I'm proposing uh, is instead of having five units that are really really expensive to maintain instead take that money send it out to the counties have the counties especially the small counties form up regional bodies to run more local facilities so instead of five prisons one reduce the number of kids that need to go there two then send them back out into the counties to have a longer term uh, secure facilities what, what would be the difference between having these uh, kind of five centralized units to yeah. these local? Yeah. What, what's the difference between oh, the two? Big thing, regionalization, closer to the home. Kid, when kids see parents, when kids see the, their loved ones, they do better. They, they stop acting up. When the kids are able to see family, they're able to tell, hey, this is happening. This is not right. Somebody's, you know, somebody's been t assaulting me. Somebody's been touching me. The families can then do something about it. Right. If the kids are two and a half hours away and they can only be seen like once a month, then abuse is right for abuse, right? Um, for the most part, I think that the local juvenile probation chiefs do a very good job of running their own counties, and they know how things need to be run in their region. Right. It's just like CPS is that every region is different. You can't always take one policy from one region and then make another region implement it. So let, let the let the little counties get together and figure out this is how we want to run our facility. And there's more accountability and oversight. Mm -hmm. um, TJJD, essentially the accountability is the legislature. We meet right. twice, once every two years. That's insane. Right. Right? D has the idea of exploring, or is there already, uh, private money coming in? Or like, for example, we see the proliferation of private prisons, for example. Is any of that money going into the juvenile justice system? Mm, mm, for the most part, no. Uh, Texas, as far as I know, doesn't really do private prisons. That's more of a federal thing. Right. Um, right. I think there was a, there was like some initial discussion of that and the backlash was instantaneous. It's basically saying even when the state is running it, it's this bad. You give it to a private prison that now has an uh, economic incentive to cut corners and to not staff it correctly, I mean, the abuse is going to be far worse. Are th it, so we hear about juveniles being in adult prisons. Yeah. Uh, do, does Texas have that? And is there any not opinions on that? true juveniles. Okay. Um, well, it depends how, how you want to define it. So according to the feds and, and, and the majority of other states, a, a juvenile is below 18. In Texas, it's below, uh, it's below 17. Right. So uh, this is um, uh, having to do with PREA, uh, the Prison Rape and Elimination Act, and a lot of other stuff. It, it, it's real complicated. Like, it depends on how you're defining it. You're defining it the Texas way or defining it the, you know, the way everyone else defines it. Right. Um, for the most part, you don't have any Texas juveniles. You have 17-year-olds who are sentenced to adult prison. Which is 
Yeah. Um, you know, just in the news the other day, there was a 17-year-old charged with capital murder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, the guy, the kid, the kid is 17. Yeah. And is possibly facing the rest of his life in prison. Yeah. Um, is no, that no, wait, wait, but the Supreme Court has said you can't do that. So. Well, right. Okay, fair enough. Yep. Pardon me. That's correct. That's correct. Now, is that part of? So you talked about raising the age. Yeah, to 18. So, so oh, to 18. Yep. So um, let me give you a little background. Yeah, this is sure. raise the age is something we've been working on since since I got elected. Um, in 2012, or 2013, when, we, when I first got my first session, Texas was one of 12 states left that had not raised the age yet. 2015, we're one of nine states left that had not raised it to 18. 2017, this last session, we're one of seven states left that had not raised it. By the end of session, we're now one of five states left. So we're on track to be dead last in the nation. What's the pushback from raising the age from 17 to 18? <sighs> some of it is financial. Some of it's like, you know, the, uh, look, I mean. Can we just start a new lotto game to pay for all yeah. this? Stuff? <laughs> well, look, the, the, house, <laughs> the house voted it out by almost 100 votes. The house almost kicked it out with a veto-proof vote. The Senate wouldn't give us a <laughs> hearing. Wow. The, you know, the criminal jurisprudence wouldn't, wouldn't even give us a hearing. Um, so, you know, I, is it just one of those things that that's the way it's always been done? No, is what it is. Uh, uh, Politics, more or less, or more or less. Something. It's, it's, it's a, it, that's a, that's a whole other show. Um, but for the most part, the people that in the house who voted no, weren't no on a philosophical level. They're no on a, because we're, we're concerned what it will do to our local juvenile proba uh, probation department. Um, and there, those are, those are legitimate concerns. Those are legitimate concerns. Um, concerned about how? That we're going to add a whole bunch of kids into a system that's already overloaded. Oh. So one of the things that I've told them is, I promise you, we will get you money if we're going to do this. We will get you money. Um, if I, uh, assuming I get reelected, I expect to be reelected, um, uh, and I, I get back on our appropriations, I'm going to make sure that there's money for this. Um, but the second thing is, um, if you ask people, how many kids would this actually add to the system? You know, the numbers right. range from apocalyptic right. to, yeah, this won't well, matter a bit. But, but again, couldn't that come to some reform and elsewhere, like looking at, again, decriminalizing? Yeah. Stop charging people. Yeah. And so that's one. That's actually one of my arguments. So, like, Harris County actually does a pretty good job of that. Harris County has, like, a... I think it's called like the 90-day program. Basically, if, you, if you're a juvenile and this is your first offense and it's a, it's a minor offense, you automatically get placed into the 90-day program. That you get screened for, you, you never see, uh, no court cases, no court records are started, you never see, go to court, you, know, you never see a judge, you never see a prosecutor, you just sign a piece of paper saying, I agree to this, and it's basically just like, hey, go 90 days, don't pick up a new charge, and go to school. Mm -hmm. Done, right? That's it, the case is over. If we can do it here, we can do it anywhere, right? You can carry the same program out all over the state. It's like, hey, you, these kids don't need to come into the system at all. They don't, you don't even need to start a court case. You don't, they don't even need to see anyone. A probation officer don't need to see anyone. The DA's office just looks at the case and say, does this case meet the bare qualifications to go to the 90-day program? You should propose that as the Sinatra rule. If, Is that, we, that? if we can do it here, we yeah. can do it anywhere. <laughs> so... So you uh, have this 90-day program, so what's the process? Okay, um, so uh, is it, first, is it the same process where the officer calls district attorney for at intake and yeah. they screen it, and then, so then what happens? I, I'm actually to... not 100% clear on exactly how it's done. I think it's post-arrest. Okay. So the kids, um, kids, kids who get in trouble don't necessarily get arrested. Uh, they don't necessarily get hauled into juvenile. Uh, only certain charges on certain crimes get have the kids required to be hauled in. I think for like petty theft, uh, marijuana, criminal trespass, vandalism, stuff like that, the kids are just like, the, the cops call the parents and say, as long as there's a parent to pick them up, send them home. Okay. Right? So they, they, they've never stepped foot in a, in, a, in, a, in a jail or a courtroom. What's your opinion on officers being able to uh, ask questions um, even though, even, even in juveniles who are being I don't want to say interrogated, but asking questions when there may be uh, crime afoot. Yeah. 
What's your so I, I've actually uh, won recently just won a motion to suppress on that very issue. So uh, under Texas law, the juveniles actually have a much, much higher level of protection against self-incrimination. So if an, uh, if an officer, if a, if a juvenile is in custody of an officer, I mean in custody, then any kind of questioning must, be, must occur after the juvenile has been warned by a judge or a magistrate. And that warning has to be on video and audio, right? And it's very clear and that, that the juvenile must waive their rights. You know, so I've gotten a number of cases where like, you know, they took a confession, it's like, I'm not, I'm not really worried about it because, you know, they have other, other evidence, you don't need the confession, but like, this confession's no good. Um, in, in Texas, um, I don't do a lot of juvenile work, okay? Yeah. Um, does a parent have to be present and should a parent have to be present? I think the, the, the child has a right to request a parent there. Uh, and I've, I've actually worked on it. When I was in the DA's office, I worked on a, a high-level murder case that basically involved that issue of, did this child request for their, for their parents to be there? They did, and you continued the interrogation. Well, it's game over. That, that interrogation's no good. So um, Texas actually provides very high levels of protection for juveniles. So this is one of the things I told you. That, you know, Texas actually is pretty much uh, like pretty ahead of the curve in a lot of the stuff. Except when they uh, get arrested at 17. Right. <laughs> right. Except for that right. one Except little that one, thing. We're, be a little we're ahead on like the small stuff. <laughs> yeah, we're behind yeah, on the big yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, And so, so you know, you're known around, you, you, we see each, I see you in downtown in the court quite frequently all the time. Um, is it, are the rest of the lawmakers like you in, in the trenches and in battling and trial and all no, these kind of things? No, um, I mean, in terms, I mean, in terms of lawyers, I'm probably, um, I think, forty uh, percent to about a third of the legis of the House are attorneys, uh, easily. Um, out of the 150 of us, I think there's maybe 10 people who have criminal justice experience, and maybe only five of us who practice actively. And are you one amongst those five? Yeah, and I'm you... probably the only one who juvenile handle, does juvenile. Wow. I'm probably, the, I think I'm I, I one of like two or maybe three people who have ever handled juven, a CPS case. If you could, um, well, so you're holding the torch. So you are yeah. the, the kind of, the one, the point man. And if you're, yeah. you're holding this, tro you're holding this torch, what's the torch? I mean, what is the, if you could paint with the brush, I mean, yeah. what is, what is the, the issues, some of the issues that you champion? So, um, Number one is raise the age. It's just, it, it will be the single biggest change to the criminal justice, juvenile justice world in, in this state for 50 years. Um, it, it's such a big deal. You're talking about 23,000 uh, and increasing number of 17 year olds arrested every single year, 23,000. Wow. If you can take those 23,000 kids per year and not have them have adult criminal records, and to have the collateral consequences that follow that, that's a big deal. That's 23,000 people who now can go to college, can, can get, get, get a job to get, and get licensed, and, and do all sort of get rent an, rent an apartment. That makes a big difference. That's such a big change. Mm -hmm. um, second is funding issues for the juvenile justice system um, to adequately fund the services that the kids need. And then, if we can, provide wraparound services to help the families. If a parent needs a parenting class, go make them take a parenting class. Right. I think the judges should order that. It's like if your kid in here is in here, I think you're you, you could use the classes. I'm gonna make you take a class as well. Well, so many of the issues, at least that I've been involved with, revolves around a detention hearing. Yeah. So and initially we used to go and I, I used to go and try to challenge a probable cause and no probable cause. You need to release this in, this this juvenile from the detention uh, that he's in in a, in a detention <laughs> hearing. But in reality, from my understanding, it's all about the parenting plan. Yes. When you release that child, yeah. uh, that that parent that there's going to be a good parenting plan. Are these the things right. that you're talking? Yeah, about? absolutely. So one of the things is um, what you're talking about for the viewers who don't know is in uh, for juveniles there's no bond. There's no bail bond. You get released when the judge says you're going to be released. Uh, and the judges basically under state law have a very specific set of criteria that they're supposed to meet um, before a juvenile is released. And generally it says like um, that 
you have a responsible adult who's going to take care of them, look after them, prevent, make sure they come to court, make sure that they don't commit another crime, make sure they don't harm themselves. Um, sometimes, but sometimes the reason why that kid got charged in the first place is because they had parents who weren't around. Right. And so that's kind of a problem. And so, um, you know, the judges will consider that. And so that child may be held in detention. Yeah. Because and if right. upon release, they may not have a support structure to support right. them. Or sometimes you, uh, I, I've, I've had several cases like this where you have a parent who refuses to pick them up. Wow. The parent says, basically, I wash my hands of them. I don't want anything to do with this kid anymore. Um, and I'm refusing to come get them. And so I'm, I'm in this battle. Then I get into this battle with CPS because now it's called a, um, uh, CPS has what we call a wrapper case, a uh, refusal to accept, accept parental responsibility. But the CPS doesn't want the case. It's like, well, they're in juvenile. They're not, they don't, they have somewhere to be. You know, at the same time, I'm like, well, no. I mean, you, they could be, they could go home right now if, the, you know, if there's someone to be responsible for them. They don't have to sit in jail. Right. If they didn't, you know, if you would just come and get them. But it's, a, it's sort of like a catch-22 of like, well, we would come get them if they couldn't be in jail anymore. It was like, well, they can't be out of jail until you come get them. So suppose that parent had uh, the ability to take maybe a parenting class yeah. or take or, or get services to yeah. provide a support structure for that child. Is that kind of what you're talking about? Or and, um, and where? Or, no, I mean the situations where the parent basically has refused ex responsibility. Right, okay. Usually that has to do with um, almost every single case I've had for that are are kids with severe mental health issues. The the, the children are violent at home. Mm -hmm. um, in one of my cases, the, the child was charged with trying to kill the parent. So the parents are like, I mean, for very, very good reasons, I, I, we, I can't deal with this anymore. Right. Um, uh, and so it's sort of, sort of stuck in this weird spot of like, what do you do? You, you can't force a parent to take this kid home, right. especially if they're, if they say like, my life is in danger, or I'm either gonna, they're either gonna hurt me or I'm gonna end up hurting them defending myself. Right. Um, for those kids that could be released and there's not a good support structure, yeah. Uh, what would be a solution for them? I mean, it can't be just keep the kid in jail so, or, or part of yeah. the detention. One of the things that we created this last session was sort of this joint managing conservatorship with CPS. Ah. So that a lot of parents, they need help. They need the additional resources that come with having somebody that can help provide them with, with say like their kid needs to go to therapy, but they don't have insurance. They make, you know, there's, they fall into the Medicaid gap because we refuse to expand Medicaid. Right. Um, and they can't get services. So, you know, uh, if CPS steps in, say like, look, you, you can be under Star Health. You can be under the CPS Medicaid. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get your kids some help. Then everything, you know, starts getting smoothed out. Um, How hard is it to get your colleagues in the legislature to buy, to believe what you tell them about yeah. these things? Because I mean, you, you hear a story about kids trying to kill their parents and parents refusing to take them back in or just even if they have severe <laughs> mental health problems and the parents don't want to come pick them up. I mean, I think a lot of people watching are, are like, that just can't be. You know, that, yeah. they, they, it's not, and, and, and it's not common. Only, and if you're the only person, yeah. you know, in the legislature who's seen those kind of issues, yeah. I mean, how hard is it to convince your colleagues like, these are real issues that we face and, and these are the things that need to be addressed. I mean, how many of them say, yeah, right, Gene, you know, just do, it, I don't I don't, don't want to hear it. From I mean, again, that's that's a whole nother show. <laughs> but um, for the most part, I, I feel like I've cultivated a uh, sort of a relationship with my with my colleagues where they trust what I say. Yeah. Um, and they trust my experience. Um, even just the like, Republicans, even the Republicans. Um, for the most part, because a lot of the times when they have criminal justice bills that they need help with, because they're not experts, mm -hmm. they'll come to me and say, hey, would you, would you help me with this bill? And I say, sure. Yeah. And that's sort of like building that kind of relationship like earns you a lot of, a lot of brownie points. Sure. Um, but just like CPS, very, very few members practice CPS or have any idea what the acronyms are, how the stuff works. And for the most part, most people don't want to know. They don't want to learn the stuff. They don't want to hear the stories. Um, what what is sort of needed to move legislation is actually quite simple. You need sort of a perfect storm 
of public outrage, bad news stories, and then people saying, okay, this is, we've gone too far. We, we need to fix this. And once that sort of like swell, that little wave comes up, all you need is to be there in the right time in the right place and say like, come, come this way. I have all the stuff already. I did all the homework for you. You don't have to think about it. I'm the oracle. Yeah. I have all the... Yeah. No, but that's awesome. true. Yeah. So like, as long as you, there's a sense of trust. Sure. That they trust that what you're putting in front of them is well thought out and is, is, is good policy and it's not going to hurt them at home. They'll, they'll say, you know, Gene, we trust you. Go, go for it. And that's what I do with CPS. And, um, you know, when I worked on the CPS bill, when we had the hearing, I mean, we, we laid out this massive omnibus, like 70-page bill. And everyone who testified said, like, yeah, it's good. We don't have any problems with it. We had, like, 80-something sections. And people were, like, we're shocked. We're like, how could this possibly be? Why? Because we did our homework. Because right. we spent months preparing for this. We had worked out all the kinks, all the details, all the, like, oh, you want to define this way versus this way? All right, fine. Well, we'll how's this? How's this? How's this work out for you? And um, it's the same thing. If people feel like they've, that you've done the homework and put in the hard work to understand the material, to understand the issues, to hammer out compromises, and they, they, they feel like you've done that, they don't want anything to do with it. They're just like, we'll vote for it. You, you tell us it's good, we'll vote for it. Right? Yeah. So. How's the, uh, so, I mean, we have a okay. minute left or so. Yeah. Last words, last thoughts? No, um, if you care about these issues, you gotta, gotta go talk to your state rep and state senators. You gotta tell them, look, juvenile, juvenile justice system is out of control. Um, we're tired of kids getting abused in lockups. We're tired of kids being left in jail um, when there's other places for them to go. Um, we want we want the state to give them more money to do these things. If if you know, just simply put, whether you're conservative and you say this will save money in the long run, whether you're a liberal and say, look, this is about justice, this is about um, uh, ending poverty, whatever your rationale is, go to your legislator and tell them. This is important to me. I am your voter. I want you to support this. What's your last word? Hey, I just listened to the, to the state rep, Gene Wu, Honorable Gene Wu. That's great. It's great stuff, man. You had, you had, I thought you'd bring up, like, the, the Cavs trading off everybody. Oh, I saw that. I think, I, okay, here's my prediction. LeBron to Houston called it. I hope you're right about that. That's all the time we have for this week, ladies and gentlemen. We thank our guest, Gene Wu, for joining us. For Julio Vela, I'm Jimmy Ardwan. We'll see you next week for another episode of Reasonable Doubt. Good night.